Hello, this is Dean and welcome to today's video. Part one of this video showed the Husqvarna box of parts, screws, and bolts I was presented with, and it took you through the remainder of the disassembly and cleanup. In part two of this two-part series, reassembly takes place of the cleaned and newly ordered parts as we attempt to get this all running again. So let's get after it. In case you've just joined, this was the box of parts and the challenge with which we were presented. Here we can see all the parts have been disassembled and cleaned and some new parts ordered. Let's begin by reassembly of the chainsaw grip. This is the trigger safety and you can see how the female portion fits into the male appendage. Here is the trigger itself and note the orientation of the return spring. The end of the spring fits inside the body of the safety like this. The female portion of the trigger fits here. Then feed the spring into the safety. Note how the tip end of the trigger fits on top of the stop pointed to here so that it works like this. Grab the other half of the grip and position it in place. This grip is held together by three 4mm bolts. Use light torque as you're tightening into plastic only. Moving on, it's time to reinstall the decompression valve on the cylinder. This valve aids in starting the chainsaw. We screw the valve into our new cylinder. And then use light torque with our socket. You don't want to over tighten. If we turn the cylinder upside down and look into the top of the combustion chamber, You'll see how pressing down on the decompression valve causes a slight opening. This opening allows for easier starting. Screw the handle attachment point onto the new cylinder. This attachment point is spring loaded and tightening requires a long Allen wrench and pliers. Shown next is the carburetor manifold collar. Pick up the manifold and route the impulse hose through the hole in the collar. Place sealant on the three manifold bolts and hand tighten the manifold to the cylinder as shown. Pick up and press the impulse hose in place. And then use your socket to finish evenly tightening all bolts. A once around shows you the way this part should look so far. Although my original plans did not include replacing the fuel line, as long as I'm this deep into the rebuild, why not? Measure the amount of line showing at the top of the case. Ours is four and a quarter inches. Remove the fuel line by firmly pulling with pliers. Now remember that the fuel filter on the other end of this line must first be removed. Next we need to check the total length of the old fuel line. In our case it was 11 and one quarter inches. Laying out our new fuel line, we're going to make it 11 and a half inches to allow for a bit extra. We mark with painter's tape and then cut. 
Spray the new fuel line with lubricant to aid with reinsertion. Press the fuel line back into the fuel line opening in the case. Feed the fuel line into the tank until the proper amount of line remains sticking out. Fish out the other end of the fuel line from inside the tank and reinstall the fuel filter. Press the fuel line and filter back into the fuel tank. Now we can reinstall the Y-shaped stop, string, and fuel tank cap. Moving on, take the new piston and spray lubricant on the piston ring groove. Then work lubricant around the inside of the ring. Place the ring on the piston by carefully spreading the ring's open ends around the piston head until the ring seats in the groove. I'll tell you what this arrow on top of the piston means soon. Now pay very close attention to this next step because it could stop you dead in your tracks and I didn't find anything on the internet to warn me about this. On one side of the piston groove is this pin. The tips of the piston ring must fit around this pin in order to compress the ring and piston enough to slide back into the cylinder. Not aware of this pin, I put the piston ring on upside down and had to remove it, flip it over, and reinstall it on the piston. The connecting rod of the crankshaft fits inside the piston after we install these crankshaft needle bearings. Insert the top of the connecting rod into the center of the piston, then pre-lubricate and slide in the wrist pin until it's centered. This is a close-up of a circlip used next. Wrist pin circlips are squeezed into this groove on either side of the piston to secure the wrist pin in place. Hold the circlip with your thumb as you use your pliers to grasp and turn the short bent end of the clip counterclockwise. Now you should feel and see the clip seat into the groove. When properly installed, the clip can be easily rotated without having it pop back out. Before installing the new crankshaft seals, Lubricate around the inside as shown. Also, squirt lubricant into the crankshaft bearings. The crankshaft seals are not specific to either side of the crankshaft, but they do need to be turned and installed as illustrated. Now is a good time to lubricate the connecting rod needle bearings and wrist pin connection points. Unlike the other seals, these cylinder base seals are specific to the side on which they fit. On the ends of both seals are small hourglass shaped tips that press into place in these grooves. Now I had a very hard time getting these to stay down and I ended up spraying them with DuPont 77 spray adhesive. Using the arrow on top of the piston as a guide, line it up with the exhaust port on the cylinder as you reassemble. The bottom of the cylinder is tapered wide enough to insert the piston and ring without compression tools. Next, lay down a small bead of sealant on both ends of the case where the crankshaft bearings will sit. Then, take your finger and smooth out the bead. Clean off any excess sealant. Cover the bottom of the cylinder with sealant and place blue thread lock on the four cylinder bolts. Now don't forget to reinsert the grounding strap as one of the cylinder bolts goes through one end of the strap to secure it in place. While holding the crankshaft in place, use your other hand to lift and position the cylinder into the case trying not to disturb the base seals. 
Using your Allen wrench, insert and begin to lightly tighten the cylinder bolts in a crosshatch pattern. Finish by firmly tightening the bolts. As shown, remember that the grounding strap is held in place by one of the cylinder bolts. This half moon shaped flywheel shroud has a mail pin that fits into a hole in the case to register its position. It also has an allen bolt to secure it. Pointed to here is the keyway on the end of the crankshaft. And here is the key on the inside of the flywheel that fits onto the keyway. Place some blue thread lock on the threads of the crankshaft. Then lift and seat the flywheel in place, aligning the key with the keyway. Finger tighten the flywheel nut clockwise. Place about 6 inches of small flexible rope inside the spark plug hole to act as a soft piston stop. Now use your socket and torque wrench to tighten the flywheel nut to the shown specifications. And then remove the piston stop rope from the cylinder. Moving on to the coil, apply sealant to the two coil bolts. And then locate the kill switch. The black wire coming off the kill switch gets looped around onto the upper bolt of the coil. The other coil bolt is inserted into the grounding strap hole. Lightly tighten the bolts but leave them loose for the next step. I am setting the gap between the coil and the flywheel magnets using a regular business card. With the flywheel magnets rotated away from the coil, insert the business card then rotate the magnets until they grab onto and pull the coil in place through the business card. Finish by tightening the bolts on the coil. If you feel a little uneasy about the business card method of adjustment, you may use a feeler gauge to the following specifications. Attach the blue wire from the kill switch to the clip on the coil. Set the flywheel shroud cover in place. This cover also allows for routing of the coil wiring. The spark plug wire from the coil may be routed as shown. Take note of how it's attached and temporarily remove the blue wire from the kill switch and route it through this hole in the case. We finish off this side of the saw by setting the starter cover in place. Pull the starter rope lightly a couple of turns to ensure the cover seats properly onto the flywheel, then tighten the cover bolts using light torque. Now we rotate the saw to begin work on the other side. Here we're removing the chain bar bolts, the Phillips screw that holds down the metal chain oiler cover, and the Allen bolt that holds down the mechanical oil pump. This is the mechanical chain oil pump. On the bottom of this pump is the pickup hole from oil drawn from the oil pump hose coming from the oil tank. Before installation of the pump, Place a film of sealant first around the bottom pickup hole, being careful not to get sealant inside. 
Lift the oiler pump in place, feeding the adjustment screw down into the hole in the case. Replace the oiler pump Allen bolt after applying sealant to the threads. You want to use light to medium torque as you're tightening into the plastic case. Take a look at the pickup hole in the oil pump feeder tube. This part of the tube will fit over the top hole on the oiler pump. The tail end of this hose fits into the groove slightly above the chain bar. Place a film of sealant around the top side of the oiler pump and lift and press the feeder tube into place. This is the pinion gear. Its threads shown here interlace with the oiler pump threads and its purpose is to spin and force the pump to turn and in turning oil the chain. Before we mount the pinion gear, this pressure plate must be installed. Now it has a very important purpose of holding in place the oil pump feeder hose. And now we mount the pinion gear and now you know its purpose. Twist it on the end of the crankshaft and give it a shot of lubricant. We follow that up with a shot of lubricant on the clutch drum needle bearing and slide it onto the crankshaft. As we mount the clutch drum, note the notches in the neck that fit onto the matching receptacles on the pinion gear. Mount the clutch drum and spin it until properly seated. Once again, we lubricate any areas of contact. Mount the clutch by spinning it counterclockwise on the crankshaft. And once again, place your rope inside the spark plug opening to hold the piston in place while tightening the clutch. I ordered this clutch removal tool and it works great. I'll leave you the links below to all the tools I ordered and the parts I purchased. In this case, tighten the clutch counterclockwise and then remove the rope from the spark plug hole. This part is called the bucking spike or dog. Place blue thread lock on the two Allen bolts and attach the dog to the case oriented as shown. Turning to the chain brake handle, install the spring in the following manner. Press the male portion of the chain brake handle into the female case receptacle as shown. Then use the handle to press the spring slightly backwards as this side of the grip pops into place. Locate and install the handle bolt on this side of the saw using light torque. Position the other side of the chain brake handle into place and repeat installation of the handle bolt. When installed properly, the chain brake handle should have a spring to it like this. Let's examine this portion of the carburetor. The low speed adjustment screw affects how the saw reacts when you first pull the throttle trigger. The high speed adjustment screw affects how the saw reacts at full throttle. Exact tuning of your saw is outside the scope of this video. This rubber shield acts as a tunnel from outside the saw through the saw case so that you can reach a screwdriver through it to get to the adjustment screws on the carburetor. Let's install it next. Pull the rubber tunnel through the case until the neck appears all the way around. I purchased a new primer bulb and installed it as follows. Just press it into place with the longer hose receptacle at the top and the shorter at the bottom. Press until it clicks in place. Install the vent tube from the fuel tank on the longer receptacle at the top of the bulb. Here we see this portion of the carburetor with its black ears that wraps around the stainless portion of the carburetor like this. 
As we rotate the carburetor, I want to show you how the choke linkage works, as we'll never have a better view. This blue choke linkage fits into this hollow round receptacle. Once we get the carburetor mounted, you'll see me take the screwdriver and press this into place. Once again, as we rotate the carburetor, we'll note two things. This nipple is where our new fuel line will attach. And here is the location of one end of the throttle linkage. To unlock it, pull the blue lever outward and rotate it up and out of the way. The actual throttle linkage goes here. And then the lock rotates back downward and clicks into place here to lock it. I'm going to practice the carburetor installation before the actual install. This clear tube goes to the other primer bulb receptacle and the fuel line from the tank goes to this nipple. The top of the manifold will be lifted to accept the upper portion of the carburetor as it's positioned and the adjustment screw fits into the rubber tunnel. Now this looks pretty good. On the black plastic portion of the carburetor, note the male appendages on either side of the bottom. Those appendages will fit into the rubber receptacles here on either side of the case. During the actual install, this will be hard to see. I purchased the carburetor gasket kit to which we will now apply sealant and thinly coat it all the way around. The oval gasket goes onto the bottom and the square one fits on the top. Position the two halves together as shown earlier and prepare the two long and two short carburetor bolts for reassembly. Shown here are the four attachment points for the bolts. Press on the fuel line from the fuel tank. And we want to make sure that the fuel line is not kinked during reassembly. Press the male appendage from the carburetor into the female rubber receptacle on the left side of the case. And then on the right side, use your flat screwdriver like a shoehorn to compress the rubber receptacle and then press down on the carburetor to install the male appendage on the right side. Now looking from the top down on the carburetor, you can see the rubber tunnel in place over the carburetor adjustment screws. Attach the clear tube from the carburetor to the bottom of the primer bulb. And once again, here is the end of the blue choke lever that we're going to press straight in. Take a flat screwdriver and press the blue arm into the hollow metal receptacle on the carburetor. Halfway down the blue kill switch wire is a clip. Slide this on as shown. Once again using a cross hatch tightening pattern, attach the carburetor's 4mm bolts. Temporarily set in place the throttle linkage dust shield. 
and we practice threading in the throttle linkage. And then practice locking it in place. and then practice unlocking and removing the linkage. Earlier we removed the kill switch linkage, now it's time to reinstall it. When the red kill switch is thrown, it causes the end of the blue wire to touch the metal clip and ground out the engine. I traced and cut this gasket from a sheet of gasket material for the muffler shield. Apply a thin layer of sealant and spread it evenly around the gasket for the next step. Set the gasket in place, sealant side down. This is the only location in which we use red thread lock. Apply it to all three muffler bolts. These three muffler holes are not hollow but act as bolt sleeves. As a result, you can drop in the bolts and they will slide downward and you can catch them on the other side. I'm holding pressure on one of the bolts with my Allen socket to assist with pushing the end of the bolt through the fresh gasket material. Repeat this process for the other two muffler bolts. And then you can begin to attach the muffler as shown. On the collar of the carburetor is a neat location onto which to snap your spark plug wire. Next, begin replacement of the chainsaw handle. This shock mounted attachment on the handle slides into the case here. And the second bolt goes here. The third shock mounted attachment point fits here. Take the body of the saw and tilt it forward so the chain brake handle goes under the main saw handle like this. Rotate the saw body to the right while sliding the spring portion of the handle inside the main saw body near the blue choke lever like this. Place sealant or blue thread lock on the three 4mm handle bolts. Insert one handle bolt into the first location as shown using medium to heavy torque to tighten. The next handle bolt goes through the chain catcher and gets placement as shown. The chain catcher is a safety device that prevents the chain from flying off the saw toward the user in case of chain breakage. Rotate the saw and place the final 4mm bolt at this location using light torque while screwing into plastic. Now that the handle is mounted, we can complete the throttle linkage. Insert one end of the linkage through the dust shield and slide it inside the handle. 
then set the dust shield down onto its rails. Unlock the throttle linkage. Attach the linkage. Then press the lock back into place and test your throttle. Screw the spark plug in place by turning it clockwise. Tighten it using medium torque, but do not over tighten. Now we can replace the spark plug wire. This new air filter came with the kit I ordered that included the new fuel line and primer bulbs and it installs like this. Now take note of the three screws that hold down the top cover. The chain lock handle may need to be pushed forward slightly in order to properly insert and seat the cover. And once again, you can use a spark plug wrench or a regular flat bladed screwdriver to secure the three screws. Now I thought it would be a nice touch and a great way to finish up this saw by ordering a stenciling kit for the chain bar. After I removed and cleaned the bar, I spray painted it and let it dry. And then I applied this stencil, taped around it, and sprayed it with colors matching those of Husqvarna. To finish up today, we mount the bar by positioning it behind the clutch drum and sliding it all the way to the rear. Wrap the chain around the gears on the back of the clutch drum. Now those of you with a sharp eye will note that I mounted the chain backwards, but don't worry. I caught this and didn't try and saw with it in this position. Feed the chain along the top of the bar inside the groove. Now once the chain is mounted, tug it outwards on the bar to tighten it. When replacing the clutch cover, make sure the bar adjustment pin fits into the female receptacle on the bar. Attach but don't fully tighten the cover nuts. Begin to tighten the chain by turning the adjustment screw clockwise. Check the slack in the chain as you turn the screw. You want to tighten this while lifting the chain until you see about a half of a chain tooth remaining on the bottom. Finish tightening the clutch cover nuts. And don't forget to place oil in the chain oil tank and two cycle fuel in the fuel tank. Let's give the primer bulb several compressions and ask that nagging question, but will it run? Uh-huh.